Good evening. Welcome to the round table, uh, the final round table of the conference, Pasolini's Legacy, that was held at Indiana University in Bloomington. My name is Andrea Ciccarelli. I'm a professor at Indiana University and the moderator of the conference. Uh, we have all the participants who are going to speak and discuss some issues related to Pasolini's legacy. And uh, the first question that I have uh, is um, um, referring to the fact that Pasolini's legacy has been extremely, extremely heavy uh, on the shoulders, we could say, of the next generations, next intellectual generation, next writers, directors, and intellectuals in general artists. Um, and it makes me think about an essay written uh, about 10 years ago, more or less, by uh, Pierpaolo Antonello, University of Cambridge, uh, in, entitled uh, Dimenticare Pasolini. This was not an article, an essay in which the scholar Antonello wanted to uh, uh, suggested that we didn't have to read or, or watch Pas or read Pasolini's works or, or watch Pasolini's movies, but of course he, he meant uh, that we needed to distance ourselves a little bit from this heavy shadow, from this long shadow that was really affecting an, an, an entire intellectual generation, uh, especially because Pasolini was so foreseen in his uh, in his intellectual uh, writings and in his artistic works. Uh, and even if died, he was killed in 1975, um, he's still considered a contemporary in many, many instances. So my first question is, and whoever wants to answer, of course, is uh, how does the current generation and the generation between Pasolini and the current generation of intellectuals in Italy and elsewhere deal with uh, this heavy inheritance? I think, I think for the two generations after Pasolini, there was this pressure related to, you know, some kind of a snobbish position in Latin American academias and artistic field to, you know, succumb to the pressure of saying that you were influenced by Pasolini. I think new generations that um, did not grow up uh, feeling that pressure can rescue many of the different aspects of Pasolini's uh, work, being in cinema or literature or journalism or any of, of the many uh, different activities that he had as a public intellectual. So I think for younger people in Latin America is a, is a free choice that maybe previous generations did not have in the same way. Thank you. Uh, I think for younger generation, they might, the mythology of Pasolini, Pasolini as a myth, uh, it can be something positive somehow because um, Pasolini is always seen as a parresiaste, something with, with, that is very close to an idea of truth. And uh, I think that in this period of time, this is something that can attract younger generation, even if the mythology of Pasolini is not Pasolini as a whole, but I think is, um, is an introduction to that. It, 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 it is an introduction to Pasolini that can be very positive and very helpful. This is my my take on that. In an English-speaking uh, universe of film production that has, uh, you know, a commitment to Euro European cinema, you have to consider Pasolini. You can't not, you can't be forgotten. How he gets taken up, I think there's a certain amount of mythologizing perhaps, but I think the fact of anyone who's sort of at the height of their powers in their medium being killed actually produces a, a kind of uh, energy of, of unfinished business. And, and 
we've, we've talked a little bit about like the death and how central it needs to be in considering a legacy. But I think, but I think if, if not, every, not every, you know, if, if that, is that is something about him that, him that is still will still be a form, a form of a kind of provocation, I think, when when, when anyone confronts him, him or discovers him. Thank you. Um, perhaps I'll, uh, I'll ask a second question then. That came out uh, in almost all the... Uh, the talks in a sense in a way or another um and it is that has to do with the one of the strongest contradiction in pasolini's poetics pasolini poetics pasolini aesthetics is based on paradoxes of course um but uh, the the issue of acculturation pasolini of course says that education acculturation in italian in italian he calls it acculturazione of course so i'm translating literally but i think it works better than just saying education in a formal way um, the issue of acculturation in pasolini is very important because uh, of course it's the basis for progress especially for his marxist ideology um, at the same time he also says that when people get acculturated educated emancipated culturally they lose what he calls la grazia the grace that is proper of people who are not educated because a certain malice comes in and changes people and so um which was also one of the issues that were talked today for instance by the in uh, professors uh, caminati's talk about uh, how liking or disliking uh, certain type of students whether or not they were bourgeois or not because exactly of that or the possibility this is a major issue sometimes in Pasolini's uh, even at the time in um, there were many interviews in which he was harshly uh, contested by his contemporary intellectuals but um, about this and I would like to know what you think about this this problem I, I could respond just briefly by saying I'm, I'm really glad that you uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, so I'm glad you raised that uh, that point uh, Andrea because I think it's an important one and I think it also is one that helps to counteract the kind of hagiography of Pasolini to the extent that you know for example uh, you know even having having met uh, Nineto Davoli and he's an absolutely wonderful person and he's literally uh, as uh, as he is in the films a kind of presence of utter exuberance and embodiment and but uh there's a part of me that can't help but feel deeply um frustrated with um the what you know for Pasolini was a kind of fetishization of um of non-acculturation and even of ignorance in a sense that for him you know in doc to be assumed into kind of uh, petit bourgeois and, and bourgeois modernity was inevitably to be kind of formed by its education and to be inducted into its kind of vertical discursive um uh, channels which he wanted to you know desperately to keep people out of and when you read his writings even you know he speaks about sort of the innocent smile of the African and you know even just seeing Nineto in some of the photos oftentimes makes me very uncomfortable because there's an, an extent to which he you know he 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 fetishized um precisely Nineto's ignorance um and while it took me many years to understand sort of Pasolini's bad Marxism and to also square it in some ways with someone like Guy Debord and the, re the refusal of work and and to understand you know it's um the absolutism of its refusal of bourgeois existence at the same time um uh, there it, it's it's on his terms essentially that these individuals would be denied entry into modernity and his own sort of self-hatred about his bourgeois existence in some ways comes at the expense of 
what might be an awakening of these subjects on their own terms, to their own, to their own kind of historical um, reality. I don't know if that is, it, it articulates it correctly, but um, it's something for, for, for whatever reason, it's always neat though that somehow for me kind of crystallizes that moment of he's kind of a mascot in a sense. And there's something, I find something disturbing about that, notwithstanding the admirable politics in many ways to which it's linked, um, it, it, there's something troubling about it. Uh, um, Ara, just uh, uh, briefly um, sort of connected to what you were saying. Uh, uh, we also, we've been, we, we tend to take for granted that what, what Pasolini says about modernity, that uh, uh, Italy, uh, Italy comes into modernity in this uh, um, almost homogeneously belated manner. We take for granted what he says about modernity. Um, uh, and uh, while, of course, Italy went through a, a process of uh, um, political unification, economic development, uh, uh, social expansion uh, that's quite uh, uh, different from that of other nation states, um, a lot of work, especially in the last 20, 30 years, has been done about uh, uh, decentralizing the notion of modernity so that uh, in the Mediterranean, uh, um, I'm thinking about Ian Chambers, for instance, uh, um, it'd be um, inaccurate and maybe not productive to to speak on one modernity with respect to which uh, uh, on the Anglo-American model with respect to which Italy was belated. And instead Chambers, for instance, in I think it's in, Med in Mediterranean Crossing, speaks uh, of different kinds of modernities, uh, of modernity uh, in a way that um, that might be worth exploring in relation to Pasolini instead of uh, 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 taking Pasolini sort of uh, um, at face value. I mean, the tendency at times is to uh, to work uh, on what he says without uh, um, deconstructing or questioning his assumptions. And the assumption here, which is very diffused, uh, it was not just unique to him, is that uh, uh, Italy, and there is an entire narrative about, uh, you know, post-war Italy becoming uh, what uh, uh, an industrial country and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and, uh, and it is a relatively homogeneous narrative. But, but how does that how does that affect sort of the, the point about his fetishization of the subjects of who, you know, who would be, um, who, who would be, be the talismans of pre-modernity? I mean, it doesn't really, I'm not sure how that would, I mean, yes, I agree that we have to sort of decenter the paradigm of modernity, but I don't think it fundamentally changes the, 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 the problem at hand, which is that of, of Pasolini's, you know, inevitable kind of fetishism of a certain kind of ignorance, which he was deprived of, right? He was kicked out of the Garden of Eden and is is deeply bitter about it. And he wants to almost imprison various subjects in that garden of non-self-knowledge. And there's something at once admirable and frustrating about it. No, I, I, I agree with, in a way, with your assessment, but I think it changes uh, somehow radically in the sense that uh, um, by saying that, uh, by taking, by accepting his version of modernity versus non-modernity, that we can say that he fetishizes uh, what he considers archaic, uh, uh, but somehow we are um, um, uh, criticizing his, his response to this distinction, but we are accepting the distinction. Uh, and instead, what I'm proposing is that the distinction itself should be questions. Otherwise, we end up repeating in a different kind of way with better intentions what Pasolini himself was doing. Um, it's, it's the opposition with between the, the fact that, uh, that uh, you're criticizing his fetish. I say, yes, he's fetishizing, but maybe we are fetishizing his fetishization in the sense that it's, it's, the, it's the ground, it's the framework uh, uh, through which he interprets modernity that uh, as... Uh, as uh, um, as people who are discussing now his legacy, uh, we may want to put, um, put into question. And there, are, I don't know where that might take us, uh, but uh, um, but it's a different uh, theoretical conceptual move. I may be a deconstructionist at heart. Mm -hmm. well, I think, I mean, the issue that I have is that I, I see Pasolini as a person of his time, and he shares uh, what Ari is saying with a lot of other 
Latin American intellectuals, you know, but they perceived as something that was uh, sold as, you know, progress. They saw it as a brutalization of the cultures that were more genuine, but at the same time, they condemned the popular classes to a state of ignorance. And so that it was part of the discussion. And that was, a you know, a, a part of that historical moment. I think that in that regard, Pasolini is not alone. You know, they share all of them, all of them share that characteristic. And we should treat Pasolini as such as a historical, as a historical subject. You know, the problem with figures that are so big is that we tend to forget that they are historically placed, you know, in, in, in a lot of contradictions. I mean, I always see, I always, I've seen him as someone ahead of his time in the sense that he had the ability to grasp the contradictions of his time, but he was also trapped in them. So I agree with you uh, in terms that, you know, there is this idealization of the popular classes. And that was the characteristic of, you know, a lot of the revolutionary men and women in South America that came from that class that they hated so much. It bothered me that much in the films. I think there's some problematic things going on in some of the writings and maybe some of the interviews that Pasolini gave. But, uh, you know, I just always felt that, you know, Nanetto Davoli was just kind of being himself and Pasolini gave him the space to be, you know, who he authentically was. Uh, I think one film that's really interesting in this regard is Notes for an African Orestes, which we talked about a little bit the other day, where, uh, you know, people argue over whether it's just this appalling, appallingly tone deaf film about a guy from Europe going to Africa, you know, trying to project all these European values on the populace there that just won't have it, you know, like the black students who are just looking at him saying, you realize Africa isn't a country, it's a whole continent of, made up of you know, dozens and dozens of countries. But you know, to me, what's valuable about that film is you know, Pasolini in, in some ways is kind of presenting himself as kind of the bad object. And he's willing to kind of take that role to expose those mechanisms. And you know, in terms of the lower classes that you see in his films, you know, I don't find the fetishization of them nearly as disturbing as, say, blonde women in Hitchcock, for instance. So, you know, for me, it's sort of not coming at it from an Italianist, uh, just I don't have those kinds of problems with his work. E c'era Giovanna Trento che voleva, Giovanna wanted to, to say something. And uh, about grace, it's a very interesting term. Uh, uh, I fully agree what um, the previous, I don't remember his name, was sitting next to um, Luca, but the fetishization of the, of subaltern uh, bodies and um, and also um, Franco Fortini criticized him a lot for being uh, eventually a non-Marxist and elitist that just pretended to be a, not a bourgeois but he actually was fully a bourgeois and so forth but uh, I do find the use of grace uh, uh, very, very interesting of this word. Also other words like reality. For instance, he wrote this article, the La Grazia degli Eritrei, raises the grace of the Eritreans, but uses this, this word grace a lot. And what I find interesting is that um, um, it's a religious word, it takes it from, the, from Christianists. And, and so it's got to do with this uh, sense of sacredness that he has uh, um, of life. And uh, this is one of the most, it's a contradiction of course, because his work is very much based on it. But I think as a, for a 
so-called Mar Marxists to make use of um, this uh, very religious word, grace, to um, describe subaltern bodies. Um, it's, it's an interesting point and we could work on it. And another very interesting word, the way he uses it is obviously reality and reality is also, you know, a word close to sacredness that, that one too, the way he uses it. And so, um, but yes, still the, the way he uses subaltern bodies is very, I find it extremely problematic. And uh, yes, I just wanted to say that. Um, I agree with much that has been said regarding um, how problematic uh, Pasolini's fetishizations and realizations are. Um, I, in my paper, quoted um, Carla Lonzi as calling him a living contradiction and as pointing to his main flaw, structural flaw, that was precisely the one of idealization. So I certainly agree with all of that. However, um, if we are thinking that there, there can be intellectual projects or a world without fetishizations or realizations, then we're being naive. There is always, we are fetishizing right now. <laughs> um, there's always going to be fetishization, some degrees of fetishization and, and of idealization of something. Um, I, I don't think that. That is necessarily a problem that can be, as long as there's representation, we don't imagine things. We're going to imagine things and then project ourselves onto others and all of that. Um, fetishize them and so on. Um, so, um, of course, there are degrees of that. That's also very important. Um, finally, the, um, the thing though is that it's not whether one idealizes or not. It's what one does with one's own idealizations that's important to the end. And Pasolini certainly was incredibly productive about his idealizations. And also, he quote unquote didn't lie about them. We can see them. We can see his fetishes and idealizations right there. There isn't much work to do. That's true, but I mean, it doesn't take away the fact that, of course, fetishization is intrinsic to everything, but it's a question of power and representation. And he had a huge stage and a huge platform. And what I find deeply, you know, frustrating is that, and he, again, yes, he admitted it freely. I'm a bad Marxist. I'm anti-dialectical. I mean, he freely admitted this, but the problem is, is that it's one thing to fetishize. It's another to deny movement and dialectical potential to the individual who is being fetishized from that state. And that is essentially what he, he wanted Ninecto as a kind of idealized subject to be frozen in that state of felicitous ignorance. And that is not only impossible, but deeply problematic because it, it, it essentially plunders subjectivity and agency to a certain extent. And so, yes, I agree. Of course, fetishization is, you know, endemic, but A, he had a platform which diffused it and B, he, you know, his anti-dialectical, I mean, I know that I'm just sort of like a, a vulgar Marxist, but he, his, his sine chosi, you know, is part of the same, I think, fabric, this denial of the dialectic, which is a, a, essentially about refusing the inexorable logic of sort of, he says all history now is isomorphic with bourgeois history, right? So any forward movement now essentially just reinscribes that. And so he refuses essentially uh, you know, he kind of tunnels beneath that uh, to the archaic past, to the medieval past, to the mythological past. Uh, but to engage with it, to admit dialectics is to sort of, you know, kind of give in to um, its logic. And it's admirable, but at the same time, it's deeply problematic, in my opinion. And well, can, I, uh, can I just really quickly, I, I, you know, he didn't stop Nanetto Davoli from getting married, you know, even though he was overwhelmed with pain. Yeah. 
<laughs> well, but how did he deny his subjectivity, though, or deny his in a growth? Symbolic way. It's not about his actual. You know, well, he died before. Um, uh, very briefly um, about uh, being a good or bad Marxist, uh, um, I mean, a certain uh, uh, dialectics, uh, a certain dialectics uh, and the idea of progress uh, does not characterize all kinds of Marxism. Uh, I mean, there, there are Marxist, uh, um, let's say, heretical traditions, uh, so to speak, uh, uh, that don't work around uh, um, dialectical movement. Okay, I look at the camera. Um, um, well, that was my close up. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, do you want to add? No, 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 I'm good. Can I, can I speak for the vulgar Marxists? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I just wanted to say that obviously, um, uh, but, I mean, it, I am, it's, it's all very good. It, it seems to me that it's all very true, everything that has been said in this moment uh, on both sides for, from the vulgar Marxist camp to the Deleuzean camp on the other side. Um, but, you know, remember that Pasolini spent a lot of his time writing to the people on Viennoise. So mm. there is a constant engagement with a certain kind of people, which mm. is the, the communists in the party, people that read popular magazines published by the Communist Party, like Viennoise. He wrote for Viennoise for 20 years. He ended up writing... <clears throat> Uh, uh, kind of a Dear Abby uh, column for he was actually responding to letters from, from readers. So uh, it seemed, he once said something in a TV interview, he said, I like two kinds of people, people who never went to school and Alberto Moravia, right? And that is to say, either high intellectuals or peasants. And why? Well, because he was witnessing these people that were becoming uh, something else, he called it, you know, mutazione antropologica, uh, people that look like my parents that I profoundly hated, um, and I'm moving into the Freudian moment of the of the conference, because, because they were exactly that. They were, they were urbanized peasants that had picked up all the petit bourgeois mode uh, of Italy in the 1970s that I profoundly hated. So personally, I found Pasolini's spite for these people totally understandable. Um, and, uh, and his love for the real people, which is the one that he represents, and this is what I talked about in Chicago, at the funerals of Giuseppe Di Vittorio, the southern, the southern uh, leader of the, of the P PSA in that case. So he does like certain people. And those are the Marxists in the party, the people that are part of a, you know, there are il, il popolo, right, as, as it used to be called. So uh, um, there is a educational, <clears throat> there is a acculturazione, but it's the alternative, the counter germanic acculturation of the Communist Party, if there is one that he embraces. I'd like to just um, problematize uh, just a, a, a minute, um, invite you to, re to, to respond if you like. Well, we were talking about the the subaltern, the use of subaltern bodies, and um, it comes to me over and over to ask, what about the cinema of poetry? What about the fact that Pasolini was first and foremost a poet and was um, not a, a, a necessarily ideological poet in Friuli in the 1940s? So we're holding him to a very high standard now in the late 60s and 70s because of how big he is and because of all of the world events that have taken place. What happens to the poetic value of those bodies? This, in a sense, was going to be my next question anyhow. I mean, and so if you'd like to answer to Colleen, that would be because I know that there is also somebody in the audience that, and um, so in, in a sense, my, if I may add up to what Colleen just said, um, one of the criticisms that was, you know, made against Pasolini was, especially in the 1970s, just, just before he died in the last few years, when he was really, really famous at the point, was from that he started writing poetry and therefore that was a really intellectual way of positioning himself, then novels, that was fine. And then he turned into, as, um, uh, being a film director, 
And of course, in that way, it was, again, a contradictory stance. I'm not sharing necessarily this. I'm just referring what we read and what, what we know about the crisis that was brought up against him, especially in the newspapers by other intellectuals. And, um, and of course, uh, Pasolini defended himself saying, actually making the example of Manzoni, saying Manzoni, the 19th century, started as a lyric poet, then he became a, a, a drama writer, and then he became a novelist because the novel was the cinema of the 19th century. And in a sense, that's what he was doing, trying to reach the people, as many people as possible, he moved to, to cinema because it was the language of reality, as he calls it. Um, so that was his defense, in a sense, without really defending himself in a, uh, answering. So this is connected a little bit about what Colleen was asking. What do you think about this? Uh, was he, well, is it contradictory, the fact that, of course, cinema reaches people, but is also a much more industrial and much more imbued into commercial art, in other words, uh, uh, media, or, uh, or is it not a contradiction? It's just what as I was saying before, I mean, there are always contradictions in life and so on and so forth. So this is my question, so my... It appears in, in, in Kati's film where he, he says, you know, people who go to the film are not, you know, people who are in tune with cinema culture, not just bourgeois, but they're an elite bourgeoisie, right? So I think he, you know, he was aware of the different channels through which his work reach people and and that's you know that's yet another i mean he inevitably must have believed in some sort of kind of trickle down uh kind of cultural um you know capital in a sense because uh you know I, i'm not sure i it would be interesting to know the extent to which i don't know if anyone has done work on you know because he used so many extras and individuals from the borgata it would be interesting to know their reception of the work you know were they actually going to the cinema to see it were they you know telling their friends about it were they engaged with it in a way that um was more than just being kind of a comparsa i'm, I'm not sure uh, may, may i uh, there was a project by a um new york artist called uh, nancy davenport who went around Rome and tried to find all the extras. Um, mm. She never made the film, but I was driving her around. So I listened to some of these, these stories. Um, but I think more interesting, there's a beautiful uh, uh, pr uh, TV program. You can find it on RaiPlay. Um, and I think it's also on Google. Uh, a journalist is asking a group of workers what they think of Teorema. Mm -hmm. um, mm. So they they, force i guess these these people uh, uh, in a northern italian factory to go see theorema and then they interview them and you can find it it's actually pretty hilarious because you can see that some of them are trying to imitate the language of the bourgeoisie so they say well this is obviously a work of art and i was really moved right <laughs> another one was saying i don't know what happened but i thought it was important so they obviously felt the cultural capital of the film and another one that's the, the only one that that uh, uh, that's i think actually said what he what he was is like ah, i was really surprised to see a woman driving um because remember she drives around so obviously pro probably because he wasn't familiar with women driving in 1970s italy so it's kind of interesting these kind of experiments of uh, that they were trying uh, most of these experiments were quote unquote right right wing experiment right to show how detached lefted intellectual and martin intellectual were from the people they were attempt to create a cut, a disparity, a, 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 yeah, a gap between the lefted intellectuals and quote unquote the people for whom they were supposed to speak. So the question where Pasolini's film impactful on the masses um, is a fascist question because it's obvious that he's not making this film for the masses. He <laughs> says it himself, right? This is unconsumable product. I make film for the elite. Yeah. Um, so it's obvious that he's, he's trying to 
and engage and entertain a certain specific group of people. Now, the, I like the Reagan idea of the trickle-down effect of, of Pasolini, the Reaganization of, of Pasolini. And that certainly uh, it might be true. But, you know, it's not that because you're a Marxist intellectual, you have to be national popular. You know, what the two ways of being a Marxist in Italy at the time was the, the Lukacian mode and the Brechtian mode. And both of them were widely um, engaged uh, by authors in, in that period. So you do find popular kind of Marxist production and you see elitist Marxist production. I don't think it can be a critique. I mean, because we are all sitting here like the Last Supper, you know, doesn't mean that we don't have a connection to the people. We probably don't. But what I'm saying is this is not enough to say that we are disconnected uh, from the people. I mean, the, the, the elitist group move in certain ways uh, independently from their ideological position. Mm. Say something about the poetic uh, root system of Pasolini. Um, and I, and I want to think about that as his radicality that it is exactly the prospect of all of his writing that allows for multiple meanings and multiple circulations, systems of circulation to occur that remains, I think, his most important legacy. His passport, he's a writer. He, yes, he became a filmmaker. Yes, he did that, but he was also a journalist. And I mean, those were all um, modes of um, disseminating his poetic thought. And I'm thinking even of polemicist, it being a polemicist as being a poetic agent, actually. So to me, it's at the core of him. Um, I make sense of Pasolini um, as a poet from beginning to end. Um, really, there isn't anything that um, it, it seems to me that everything is cursed through by um, an attention to the poetic but the poetic um, yeah in, in the etymological sense right M making um, he had to experiment uh, it wasn't a, a continuous experiment um, and he never ceased to be a poet for it. Um, he continued what he was trying to develop in one medium in another one, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's the way I at least make sense of the diversity of discourses and media and forms and so on that he, um, um, that he articulated throughout his life. Um, yeah, a poet. I would say that, you know, uh, Roberto Saviano should be mentioned. Roberto Saviano should be mentioned as the true heir of Pasolini's, you know, legacy in his um, own way, in a very honest, and I'm not saying anything original here, but since he hasn't been mentioned, I just mentioned it, he doesn't uh, look at the same people with that kind of erotic gaze um, and at the same time, he has his books, and then the films that are kind of um, that derived from his books um, uh, had to go through or have gone through the same process uh, that we, you know, talked about you know yesterday or two days ago about the Decameron. So we get Suburra based on Gomorra, you know, the Decameron one, two, three, and four, five. So I, we all of us had great respect for Saviano. I just thought that it would be worth mentioning. I would like to ask the public if they have any question. If you come closer and you speak up, it doesn't matter if we don't see you, but we can hear you if you come closer to this computer. So I know that some of you have some questions. And so I think it's fair to give you a chance to ask. But you need to come closer to the computer to ask us. Possibly before midnight because we would like to. Uh, it was linked to 
Colleen's question about poetry, because when I think about Pasolini's legacy, I think about uh, the sdoganamento mm. of the emancipation of uh, Italian dialect poetry. So all the dialect uh, poetry in Italian dialects that developed after Pasolini's dialect poetry. So uh, why are we always talking about movies and like not always considering this uh, emancipation of Italian dialect poetry? I mean, um... You know, um, uh, when I was a student in the last century, I remember um, my professor was a uh, historian of Italian language, said that um, the kind of the, the decay um, of the Italian um, idioms, you know, the dialects, um, was something that linguists had been uh, discussing for many, many years, but had become a central issue only thanks to Pasolini. So we all know that uh, poetry in dialect um, is uh, something that has been going on in Italy for a long time, you know, Porta, Belli, um, they preceded Pasolini, uh, but certainly, you know, thanks to Pasolini, uh, the dialect, uh, at least for a short period of time, acquired a a kind of a momentum, so to speak, that then probably lost again. Thank you, Armando. Um, other questions? I know that there were some questions with George, if you would like to come here. That uh, lively that the debate uh, you were having about how problematic uh, Pasolini is. Uh, why is it, and, and to talk about his legacy, why is it American Academia cancelling him for having sex with underage boys the way uh, other authors of the same era are under attack. What, what is your opinion about that? Well, j just it briefly. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's a, it came up two weeks ago at the conference in Montreal and, um, and uh, it was a very interesting paper. It was, a, it was, on, it was a panel on uh, Pasolini and cancel culture um, and basically sort of took up the, these threads of being dialectical with relationship to his work and, you know, acknowledging that we can take the, the, basically the good with the bad. Um, and, uh, one of the points that, uh, Luca, um, uh, Peretti and Karen Raisin raised was that, um, you know, what one person sort of defensively said, well, do we know the age of the individuals with whom he had sex, you know, what was the, you know, in Italy, the, the, the age of consent is lower. And, and their point, um, I think rightly was not whether or not it, you know, um, empirically or legally was legal or illegal. It was that in certain instances, he inevitably had, a, there was a power dynamic that he abused in certain instances. And we can recognize that without canceling him too cool. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, as as far as Pasolini being cancelled by American academia, I don't think they know him well enough to, I don't think he enters into the purview of, um, you know. Uh, yeah. of, it's art cinema. It's art. They think, of, yeah, people think of Pasolini as a filmmaker, basically, and, and Salo as a kind of gratuitous, scandalous gesture. I don't mm -hmm. think they, he doesn't have the same um people don't know him well enough to cancel him i guess would be maybe the the idea but in, in italy has he been canceled for that reason no yeah i just want to say that was, <clears throat> i just wanted to say that i was about to say exactly the same thing i mean the last thing that you said uh, um the point is that i don't think he's known enough by North American academia to be cancelled. Otherwise, probably he would be. I was just going to say, say, I mean, isn't, I mean, my understanding, understanding is they don't cancel dead it. people as much as they cancel people who are still alive. There's almost a sense of like, well, it's not, not like, like we can ruin their career. They're already dead. <laughs> I don't know about that because there is, you know, 
it's been now over 20 years that in so many um, American high schools, US high schools, you cannot teach Mark Twain. You cannot teach Richard Wright. So um, this, is, uh, it's, uh, this has been a long way coming. Um, and it started with, um, not with the university and colleges and talking about it started at the high school and middle high school level first. And certainly that people have been canceled in that way. Or that's, uh, well, that's, yeah, well, that's, well, that's because of what's in the books, not because of the personal lives of the uh, artists. Um, I, I wonder whether the cancel culture we're talking about has enough sophistication to make a difference. I don't know. Maybe it doesn't, but I don't think so. To make the differentiation between what the author, let's say, did in his or her life and what in a book. I'm not sure that that's, that's too subtle. <laughs> I think there is also an exoticizing uh, relationship to Italian culture that people often have, mm -hmm. uh, especially in the United States, uh, and uh, the way they've they've got uh, um, acclimatized, uh, perhaps with uh, again, uh, for instance, the, the Italian strong. Uh, uh, sexism and misogyny um, is part of a, a which wouldn't accept uh, um, or tolerate uh, um, at home uh, um, uh, has contributed to uh, uh, perhaps uh, I'm not saying that there should be the can the cancellation not at all I think can cancel it is, is quite a complicated operation otherwise it's censorship so the problem is how do we relate to problematic aspects uh, uh, without doing censorship and while uh, and without uh, um, foreclosing them uh, but in in the case of Pasolini I think uh, as it happens with many Italian things uh, um, the the exotics exotic component uh, might uh, might be playing a role I think it's a good question. And um, in Italy, I can tell you, you know, uh, I have not a very broad knowledge of the Italian intelligence at the moment, but um, I noticed that uh, um, some uh, heterosexual um, academics, and they don't need to be in their 90s, but, you know, in their 40s and so on, the ones who take themselves very seriously and they happen to be heterosexual, they tend to have, um, because I know people, they tend to have a dismissive attitude. So like, you know, uh, and they can um, give you a number of justifications that would be, well, I mean, his movies were you know, really that not that good, or his poetry was not really that good. But the reality is that the deepest, at the deepest level, uh, basically the foundation is Pasolini's flamboyant uh, homosexuality uh, that was unbecoming, and it is kind of still inappropriate. And I say this because I really, I noticed that even two days ago, there are some of the colleagues that attended the uh, the um, conference in Chicago, uh, they paid a very quick visit in order to, you know, show their face. But um, they uh, look down on people who actually uh, spend time working on Pasolini and they can come up with all kinds of interesting reasons. But the reality is really the foundation is Pasolini's homosexuality. That was not a secret, but it was really uh, explicit. Another attitude from, you know, the old guard of uh, Italian professors um, is to look at Pasolini uh, from, a, you know, a very stylistic point of view, his poetry, the rhymes, and the sources that, you know, uh, Medea is based on this tragedy and yeah so it's kind of a um, there are a number of procedures that uh, uh, Italian academics can use in order to um, kind of uh, turn Pasolini into something digestible and uh, approachable but the, 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 you know the homophobic Italian attitude that is very very Italian is there uh, it's absolutely there so it's a very good question. 
Yeah, I. Oh, go ahead. Oh, so it's just brief. I think that here in the US, a lot of people who know nothing about Pasolini read his whole career uh, from his the way he died. And I think that's the narrative that they use to make an interpretation of what he did and to cancel him from a conservative point of view. So I think that is crucial to understand because if you Google Pasolini, that's the first thing that you see, you know, the way he died and that conditions, and I'm not talking about people outside of academia, academics to look at Pasolini from that point of view. So that cancels any possibility to teach or to investigate more about his, his work. Thank you. Um, do we have is a question? Ah, do we have any other question? Uh, maybe it's it's too broad as a question. It's linked to what Giorgio said. I was wondering how do you approach Pasolini and his works when you teach Pasolini? I was going to jump on board at, in the previous conversation to say this is uh, Giorgio. This is pre precisely we. For me, we have to go precisely towards what makes us uncomfortable for Pasolini. And we have to be actively render him um, uncomfortable, as uncomfortable as possible again today. We can't cancel him. And I agree with, with my colleagues that he's not central to so many curricula for a broad variety of reasons. But Pasolini wanted to be on the line of fire. He wanted to be at, at the, on, he wanted to represent that point of contention that was always risking to be canceled. And that's where we have to engage with him. In the spirit of, of critical race theory, everything that's making us debate about what is appropriate and not appropriate to be discussed. It's Zanzotto himself who says, we have to go al di la of any accusation of pederasty. We can have our perspectives about that. It can be factual, it can be subjective. But once, once we, we have to go past that accusation and engage with Pasolini exactly on that line of contention. So that's me also answering Nicolo's question about teaching him and accepting that the body and sexuality and the eroticization and the possibility that we could be physically with our bodies our minds and our spirits attracted to the young people in front of us with whom we're engaging or making a film is part of the phenomenology and the reality of teaching. I'm done. And also, you know, a society like this one that is knowledge and artistic uh, production is so co compartmentalized, someone who intervenes in so many different fronts, right? That was a poet and a writer and a journalist and filmmaker who wanted to reach through different channels. So you can teach, you know, from all these different perspectives. So if film doesn't do the work, you can, you know, show what he wrote in the, in the newspapers or the poetry that he wrote, I don't know, about Brazil. So you have so many points of entry to his, his persona and his place as a public intellectual. So that I think is also something that we should explore in the, in the classroom. Thank you. We have time for maybe one last question, if there is a question from the audience again. I think there was somebody who had questions before. I, oh, oh, you wanted to answer, please, go ahead. I just would like to add some, a little, some more uh, to the conversation of about how teaching Pasolini, teaching Pasolini, uh, etc. Um, but I want to step back a little bit and I was just thinking, you know, I regularly teach, uh, I don't know, Karlschmidt in courses. I'm talking about a monster, a far more monstrous than anything I can think of, uh, let alone also. Um, so what is it that makes us, I think, rightly, legitimately ask, um, how does one teach? something that is so ex sexually explicit, um, graphic, uh, sexually controversial, and so on. And I do think that um, it, 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 um, it, it comes down to a question of Foucault would call, did call it the deployments of sexuality. 
there are um, some authors, some uh, thinkers, writers, filmmakers, and so on, who um, have done far, far more, as I call them, monstrous things that did not necessarily involve sex. And those kind of can go very easily under the mirror. So there's something about sex and sexuality that is still um, unanswered, still crucial and central here. Um, so. Thank you. Well, then uh, I take advantage of this moment of silence and shyness from the crowd. Um, not even Angelo is asking a question. And uh, um, to thank everybody here for the wonderful conference, the wonderful presentations, um, this very lively round table. And um, I have lots of answers, of course, that I keep it to myself because mm -hmm. I'm just the moderator. <laughs> and, uh, and really, I would um, encourage everybody to read and watch Pasolini regardless of his private life, as I encourage everybody to read and, I don't know, Petrarch. Petrarch was not necessarily a very nice person in his private life, but because he lived in the Middle Ages, we do not care, right? So the point is, we have to contextualize, we do not have to forget to contextualize. Pasolini was born in 1922, the year my father was born, and um, Pasolini, of course, grew up in a different Italy, in a different Europe, and certain things were almost normal. We don't have to forget it, unfortunately. I'm pretty much sure that uh, that justification is done in many, in many, we forget the contextualization. And um, so I think uh, we don't have to condone him, but it doesn't mean we don't have to read him or watch his films or and learning something from whatever he does, not from his private life from his public life, from his artistic life. And this is something I wanted to say. Um, but uh, uh, I thank everybody. Thank you, everybody. And um, we close up the round table of this Pasolini's Legacies Conference at Indiana University. And thank you very much for being here. And thank you very much for having participated. Thank you.